How are you breathing after that? <laughs> See, Aaron, did you notice that he became the instrument? That he was holding a piece of cold metal in his hand and he became the instrument through which God's divine expression as music and harmony flowed. Do you think you are any less the instrument than Aaron? Shake your head like this. No. <laughs> you do not have to hold a, a, a saxophone in your hand to be the instrument. You just have to be aware that you are the instrument. So I begin with a classic contemporary current day parable about entering into the flow of being one with the breath of God. Once there lived a village of creatures along the bottom of the great crystal river. The current of the river swept silently over them all, young and old, rich and poor, good and evil, the current going its own way, knowing only its own crystal self. Each creature in its own manner clung tightly to the twigs and the rocks of the river bottom, for clinging was their way of life, and resisting the current which each had learned from birth. But one creature said at last, I'm tired of clinging. Though I cannot see it with my eyes, I trust that the current knows where it is going. I shall let go and let it take me where it will. Clinging, I shall die of boredom. And the other creatures laughed and said, Fool, let go, and that current you worship will throw you tumbled and smashed across the rocks, and you will die quicker than boredom. But the one heeded them not, and taking a breath, did let go, and at once was tumbled and smashed across the rocks. And yet in time, as the creature refused to cling again, the current lifted him free from the bottom and he was bruised and hurt no more. And the creatures downstream to whom he was a stranger cried, see, a miracle, a creature like ourselves, and yet he flies. See, the Messiah come to save us all. And the one carried in the current said, I am no more a Messiah than you. The river delights to free us if only we dare let go. Our true work is this voyage, this adventure. But they cried the more Savior, and all the while clinging to the rocks. And when they looked up again, he was gone. And they were left alone making legends of a Savior. You see, I think that is the most profound contemporary parable of what we're talking about today, which of course is Palm Sunday. This story is about the willingness to let the lesser go so that we ascend to the greater. And when we're willing to do that, the greater does ascend within us, lifts us, carries us. You see, the, the, the metaphor of this of story, of course, is the crystal river is the flow of life. It is God. It is infinite intelligence that knows where it's going, always. And the rocks and the sticks and the, 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 that at the bottom of the river bed are those things that we cling to that represent the fears that we don't know how to let go of. And when we cling to those rocks and twigs at the bottom of the, the riverbed, the flow of life passes us by and we resist what we've come here to do and be. 
to enter into the flow of life fully and experience and express the divine nature of the river itself, God. You see, Palm Sunday, I think, is, is the epitome of uh, a classic story of what the power of divine surrender is all about. I believe that the great teacher Jesus was indeed the great example, not the great exception. And he came here to be a model as to how to have the highest relationship possible with God, whom he referred to as the Father. And if you think about the, the story, uh, the Easter story, which we're going to come to culmination next Sunday with myself and Reverend Temple and, and Alan and our great music department, but today we're setting up the stage for it. If you think about this, the, 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 the Garden of Gethsemane was the defining moment. The gar you realize that without the Garden of Gethsemane, Easter and the resurrection could never have happened. So the teacher had to go through that purification first. And the word Gethsemane in Aramaic means oil press. In other words, the Garden uh, in the Mount of Olives was an olive uh, grove which was used, they used to harvest the olives and press them so that the precious oils would be extracted from them and the husks discarded. What a, an amazing metaphor. So when, when, when the teacher Jesus came to the garden, if you can imagine the Christ essence of him being drawn out in that moment of his own revelation, of his relationship with God as one in it and with it. Now, in the garden, this is where the teacher had the opportunity to wrestle his spirit, the, 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 the man Jesus wrestled with the divine Jesus. The spirit and the body, great, great consternation. So much so that it is said that he existed in that moment and bled tears of blood, drops of blood, which of course is an idiom for what? The, the story is full of idioms and metaphor. The idiom is, he was scared spitless. <laughs> the human nature of the teacher was revealing itself for him to dance with. And so he had a chance to reconcile his own divinity and to be faced with his own fears and to embrace those fears and to turn them over. Of course, he brought with him to the garden that night the three of the, his disciples, Peter, James, and John. Peter and the, the Zebedee brothers. And he, they walk into the garden, and he knew what was happening. He knew that, that he was going to be betrayed. He, he knew. He set it all up because it was part of his divine plan. But he tells the guys, he says, you guys, you camp out down here. Keep watch. I'm going to ascend. I'm going to go up the hill. And that's a, a metaphor in consciousness to go up, to rise in consciousness. And I'm going to pray. And I want you to stay down here and, and keep guard. So he goes up, and he's praying and what does he say? You know the ter what he says in that moment where he is, his fear is just ascending on him. And he says, Father, 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 if it be thy will, pass this cup from my lips. But thine will be done. So he gives it up to God. And he comes back down the hill. What does he find? The guy's sleeping. <laughs> Metaphor for ego separating itself from spirit. So Jesus comes down expecting he's going to have a, his, his prayer partners there to support him and get him through this, uh, this experience. And they're asleep. So what does he say? Wake up, you guys. I'm going to go back up and try again. So he goes back up the hill, and again he prays. He says, Father, for it and will, pass this cup from my lips, but not my will, but thine. And he comes back down. There they are again, sleeping. The lower aspect of ourselves oftentimes falls asleep when we are trying to awaken to the truth of our being. 
And he says, oh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Isn't there that part of us that's really willing and able? You know, you know, he went up and down the mountain three times to give it up to God and ended up bringing it back down with him. He had to go back up again, take it back down again. He went up and down. through. Have you, have you ever given up your issues to God only to reclaim them and take them back again and again and again? <laughs> this is, this is the, 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 the amazing story of the teacher, the master teacher showing us that he too was as human as you and I. And yet he also understood the divine nature. He understood who, who, who he came here to be. <laughs> so, Jesus' defining, redefining moment, great name for a book, by the way, Redefining Moments. That was a little plug, but no, never mind. <laughs> His redefining moment came in the garden. And that moment came when he ascended in knowing, self-knowing, capital S, and he remembered who he was. Not Gnosis means Gnostic. It means remembering, knowing the truth of our being. And in that moment in the garden, he got it. I and the Father are one. And that self-knowing stayed with him and became that which he identified himself with. And he proved it the, 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 later that night or the next day he was taken before Pilate. And what did Pilate say to him? They say, they say you're the, the king of the Jews. That, are you? And Jesus had no need to be defensive or to, to, to go, to, well, yes, I am the king of Jews. He, he didn't, he, all he did was stand in the truth of the moment and say, he said this, it is as you say. There's the great, great law, isn't it? It is as you say. He had no need to defend himself because he knew who he was. He had no need to convince anybody else of who he was. What, in other words, what you think of me is none of my business. So, and, and the rest of the story from that moment forward, he stood in his truth. There was no uncertainty. There was no fear. He, I know he still suffered through his experience, but he was certain of who he was and why he was there. The living vessel through which God revealed himself to humankind. But think not that you're any less. And this is what I know. That you don't have to be worried about being crucified, literally, to be in your own garden of Gethsemane. That we each have those moments where we enter the garden of our own fears. Where we are attached with anxiety to the, the twigs and the rocks at the bottom of the river. And we're resisting the divine flow because we're just swallowed up in that garden experience where we're wrestling with our fear between our divinity and our humanity. And maybe, maybe your garden is, is, is in the moment where you are facing a health issue, or, you, or your garden is in the process of losing a job, or changing your financial status, or a relationship issue. Whenever there's fear, it wraps itself around us and keeps us from ascending to the nature of who we've come here to be. And here is the practice in those moments. Remember who you are. It is not my will, Father, but thine that be done. And of course the question is, what the heck is God's will for us? God's will is one single-pointed. God's will is to have a larger place in your life through which it flows, unfolds, and expresses its own nature. Love, compassion, joy, selflessness, peace. Take a nice deep breath. Are you allowing God's will to have its way in your life or are you continuing to 
cling to the things that are, that, that are causing you a sense of separation from that flow of life. Do you think that God's will is for, any, for you to, is anything other than to be fully and wholly expressed as the divine being you came here to be? What's, what's not to love about that? To give up. Not, surrender is not like I give up. It's divine surrender. I give up. I give up. So where do you sit in, in the garden today? What rock or twig did you bring in here that you're clinging to that is keeping you separated from truly allowing the divine nature of the one to begin to flow in you? It's not difficult. It takes courage. It takes willingness. It takes faith. It takes knowing that you are not here by mistake. You are not here by mistake. You've been put here to be the vessel through which, but more importantly, as which the Divine One unfolds itself. And if you are not allowing that to happen, you are not honoring your purpose for being. So this week, between now and next Sunday, when we come back together to experience the Easter experience, I invite you to sit in the garden, whatever your garden of Gethsemane may look like. Don't run from it. Don't anesthetize it. Don't deny it. Sit with it. Embrace it. And open to the idea that God's will is for you to transcend that experience. But you have a role to play. And it is letting go. And letting God. Deep breath. We close now with a song that I kind of dedicate to you.